Well, that was a fucking shit show. <laughs> we need help, everybody. <laughs> All right. Hi, guys. It's Weird Mythic Podcast. This is Weird Mythic Podcast. And thanks for tuning in, everybody. We're trying to figure out how to record from a distance. And I'm apparently an 80 year old woman who can't figure shit out. So I don't know what we're going to do, guys. <laughs> yeah. So this is via Zoom again. Hopefully it's uh-huh. not too terrible. Yeah, hopefully the audio sounds good and you guys aren't cringing over what's going on or however I, list or however it sounds on your guys' end. <laughs> I really can't even hear myself right now, so I just don't know what I sound like, but <laughs> you sound fine to me. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. You have to say that. No, it's true. You are perfect <laughs> <laughs> in every way. No. <laughs> All right, guys. So one of the reasons why we're recording from in distance today is if you haven't noticed, Serena's actually leaving me and heading to Texas, and we're trying to figure this out before she leaves me. Yeah, so this is episode 16, I believe. Mm-hmm. We're going to be talking like that. Yeah, we're going to be talking <laughs> about some sparkly vampires. <laughs> okay, I am not talking about any sparkly vampires. You can guarantee that. <laughs> I know. I, I wrote out all the Twilight stuff, and don't worry, I'm not going to bring it up. Uh huh, sure, sure. No, bring it up. I have like a whole list of vampire movies actually. And Twilight is on that list. So I I saw. (laughs) Oh yeah. I took my notebook. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I guess I'll go first. I'm going to talk a little bit about the casket girls and then I'll get into like typical, like uh, protection description, Mm -hmm. how to kill a vampire. And then we're going to listen to your stories. I guess we'll go like that. All right. Yeah. Sounds good to me. All right, we should have talked about this beforehand, but you know. No, let's do it now. <laughs> it's all part of the process. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, yeah, this episode's about vampires. Yeah. In case you guys didn't get that. Vampires. <laughs> I'll talk about the casket girls first. So some say that they were, you know, the women that brought vampires over to New Orleans. Some say that they were fine young women. Some say that they were orphans. Some say that they were prostitutes. So okay. they arrived in 1728. The port of New Orleans bustled with activity, the shouting of men, the stamping of hooves of the horses, the scraping of boxes as the ships were unloaded. For the group of young women aboard the ship, New Orleans was a taste of the forbidden. So these women were ushered down the wooden plank onto the soiled ground and to their chest, they each clutched a coffin shaped small chest that held their belongings. So, okay. And I think it was called like a casket, but spelled differently. But you know how things change over time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so handpicked by the Bishop of Quebec on order of the French king, the young women were all of appropriate age and background. And I don't know what appropriate, appropriate age, age in this time because... And this is the 1700s? Yeah. So they probably weren't you 18. Know, that could possibly be 12, like 13, 13 or 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's gross, yeah. but okay. Yeah. Yeah. Appropriate age. On their agenda was one thing to make a good match and marry one of the French colonists inhabiting the budding Louisiana colony. So they were basically oh. brought over to be wives to these people that were in oh. New Orleans at the time. Upon the side of them, rumors then began to circulate throughout the town. Coming off the ship, they were very pale. The journey mm. was only supposed to take two months. I could be wrong. It ended up taking something like five months. So imagine the lack of food yeah probably lack of sunlight immediately when they walked off of the boat their skin turned like completely red and started blistering and then so until their marriages the young women were actually under the care and protection of the ursuline nuns at the ursuline lake convent Mm -hmm. people were super excited to have them come there and then all of a sudden they're like really suspicious because i don't know why i don't know why i really don't know where the suspicion started apart from like they were carrying coffin looking bags and right what what country were they originally from so i think originally originally from france but then they came from quebec so i don't know how soon gotcha they were just from quebec or if they came over to quebec from france Okay. People are like, have have the new girls, you know, transported vampires with us. The mortality Mm -hmm. rate after they arrived seemed to go up a lot. (laughs) So... But that and could that, just be people getting off of boats and having... Well, exactly. Like, you have like an illness yeah. and you don't know what animals were brought over or rats or disease. You know, you don't know any of that. So right. for them to just be like, vampires. 
<laughs> kind of weird, but I don't know how I feel about this still. I'll read a little bit more, but okay. to me, I'm like, I don't really think that that's what happened. Basically, they're now with these Ursuline nuns and the girls were said to be stored on the, like the very top floor, the third floor, which is mm-hmm. kind of like the attic, I want to say. And so it's the third floor that then sparks the imagination of people thinking that they're, these vampires are coming from mm-hmm. there. So it said that each window also is nailed shut with nails that were blessed by the Pope hmm. to keep something in or keep something out. I don't know. But <laughs> residents of Louisiana have seen the shutters like fly open and shut mm-hmm. despite them being bolted down. <laughs> weird. Yeah, weird. So the notion of the vampires escaping from the third floor then was like, yeah. The people in the French Quarter were like, vampires. <laughs> and that's, that's what happened. So, that's so what, they just kept them locked up? Until, well, until they married off. So How strange. Yeah, and it was really sad too, which I didn't really want to get into a lot of it. But once they did marry off, you know, the husbands weren't very nice to the girls. And no. a lot of them didn't have good relationships and died young anyways. So, mm-hmm. yeah. How sad though, just to be moved from one country to the next probably promised that somebody's going to take care of you and you just got to be a wife and nice to the man. Yeah. And then to get passed around and this and that is just. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's sad. (sighs) Huh? Yeah. So we'll get into kind of like what a vampire is. So do you have anything on like what a vampire is? Well, you know, from pop culture. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I do. (laughs) Um, so I don't have any definitive definition of exactly what a vampire is. No, I don't have that. It's what, like a a being that feeds, typically feeds on blood. Mm -hmm. It's Yes, live blood. To sustain itself. Humans, preferably. And Anne Rice's books. (laughs) Do they not? At some points, at some points, mainly Louis, who my cat is named after, he doesn't like to kill humans. Okay. But he was made into a vampire because so what is he doing? rats? Oh rats. I never he drinks the blood theory. from from bats or, or rats, I mean, from okay. rats. And at one point, Lestat gets extremely injured in interview with the vampire and other parts of the other books, of course. But he gets really injured and he's in a fire and he can't like go out and get humans because he was in a fire and he's all laid up half dying when he's already a vampire and he starts to feed off of alligators snakes turtles anything that's in the swamp so, okay where yeah. he's located then yeah because okay. they're they're in new orleans okay well the casket <laughs> girls brought him over <laughs> possibly is there, anything, is there anything in those books about that at all does it mention it at all because everything I nothing think it, specific about it no I think at one point in Vampire Diaries, which I could be completely wrong because I haven't watched the whole series or the originals. Um, <laughs> I think at one point it might be in the originals. They mentioned Casket Girls, mm-hmm. but like I said, I don't buy it. I don't. I don't believe that yeah. that's a thing. But let's get into like the creation yeah. of vampires then. Mm-hmm. So in Slavic and Chinese traditions, any corpse that was jumped over by an animal, particularly a dog or a cat, was feared to become a vampire. So a corpse <laughs> getting jumped over are gonna raise from the dead um <laughs> I, mean, I like think of zombies just... i know well a lot of times they're they're not considered zombies but they keep saying you know the walking dead or the mm-hmm. raised from the dead and i'm like is that not a zombie but so, i want to say in like japan and in other countries um that like the zombie vampire thing is pretty closely related Okay. Like, I think the the whole zombie thing is that they're mindless beings when vampires are not. Okay. All right. So in Russian folklore, vampires were said to have uh, once been witches or people who had rebelled Mm -hmm. against the Russian Orthodox Church when they were alive. And then there's cultural practices that then evolved in tending to basically like prevent recently deceased loved ones from becoming vampires. So if I'm going with your family to bury you, Naomi, which I would then recommend that this is what they do so that you don't become mm-hmm. a vampire knowing okay, everything thank you. we know, right? I got you. Right. Don't worry. Thank Me you. and your mom are going to talk about it <laughs> when you guys come to Houston. Exactly. <laughs> Um, All right. So burying a body upside down with, I think, the head facing Mm -hmm. the sky. Okay. Um, Placing earthly objects such as scythes or scythes. Yeah. Yeah, Like the, was that the red caps? 
carry those? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The <laughs> yeah. scythes. Yeah. I don't like those either. Okay. Um, near the grave to satisfy any demons entering the body or to appease the dead so that it will not wish to rise from its coffin. Okay. So it kind of sounds like a demon could possess the body type of thing, mm-hmm. but everything we know, I feel like they have to be a living being for it to be like a demonic possession. Mm-hmm. So not sure. It's a theory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ancient Greek would actually place a coin in the corpse's mouth. Okay. To basically like uh, essentially pay the toll to cross the river Styx in the underworld. Okay. So, yeah. During that journey to the underworld. <laughs> <laughs> during the journey. A, yeah. During the, there's a lot more. Like so many. That's just a few. Um, so identifying vampires became a thing. There were many rituals that were used to actually identify a vampire. Um, one method was the uh, the you would have to find the vampire's grave. Mm-hmm. So in order to find the vampire's grave, a virgin boy would ride through the graveyard or church ground on a virgin stallion. <laughs> and then the horse would refuse to go on the grave of the vampire. So, huh. He would just not walk on that. He just knew. And what country was that from? I don't remember. That's um, crazy. Yeah, How interesting. Typically, yeah. Typically the horse was black, but mm-hmm. in Albania, the horse should be white. So it's a bunch of different places that do gotcha. have this practice in order huh. to find a vampire's grave. But it just okay. depends. Varying regions have different things. And then sometimes there will be like holes that would appear in the ground over a vampire's grave. That's mm-hmm. another sign. Or a zombie trying to escape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Corpses thought to be vampires were generally described as having a healthier appearance than expected. So basically, if I were to be like, oh my God, this bitch is a vampire. Let's dig her up. And then we open it. They would be like plump in the face. There would be little yeah. signs of decomposition, basically. Sometimes, even when the graves were open, there would be actual blood on the mouth right. of the corpse, which is fucking terrifying. Which I have explanations for that. So yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it's still fucking it's- terrifying, even if it's <laughs> science. Okay. <laughs> science. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Let's get into protections, how you can protect yeah. against a vampire. There is a lot of different things that you can use to either ward off or kill, I guess. I don't know. Kill a vampire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Garlic <laughs> is a common example of that. Mm-hmm. I have no idea why though. There was no explanation to me. Yeah, so. I I can't find any reason why the garlic is a thing either. Um, even the silver, I don't quite understand. So hopefully you got something for that. Yeah, the only, <laughs> I, I don't. Well, see, iron would make more sense to me. I don't know why silver. I don't know. Iron either. makes more sense. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Considering okay. it's something that the Catholic Church used, like exactly. we talked about in fairies and stuff. Yeah, how it's exactly. something that the Catholic Church uses to ward off evil. Um, but it also kind of the Mononongal, how she doesn't like vinegar. Yeah. And garlic <laughs> Just, too. She doesn't it, like garlic either. There, see, so, something's with that garlic. <laughs> A branch of wild rose and hawthorn are said to harm vampires. And in Europe, sprinkling mustard seeds on the roof of a house was said to keep them away. Other things would include sacred items. So like a crucifix, holy water, rosary, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. As you know, playing on that a little bit, vampires can't walk on consecrated ground. So no church, no graveyard, Mm -hmm. anything blessed, I guess, would be considered consecrated, right? Or they can't cross running water. Oh, yeah. So I did not know that one. Mirrors have been used to ward off vampires when placed on a door facing outwards. Okay. In some cultures, vampires don't have a reflection and sometimes do not cast a shadow, perhaps as a manifestation of the vampire's lack of a soul. This attribute is not universal, though. And mm-hmm. I think in um, your series, do they have a reflection? So yes, there is a reflection. Okay. So the thing with the mirrors and vampires was back in like the 17, 1800s. And the reason why is goes back to that silver thing. So they used to put a silver plating behind glass. The way we make glass now is not made the same. So there's no silver lining. So okay. nowadays they would be able to see the reflection, but back in the day they wouldn't because of the you silver. You better carry a silver plated <laughs> compact with you just to check. 
Yeah, exactly. Like exactly. we can't be friends until you show me your reflection. I'm all, in this mirror. I'm all like this, like, <laughs> like having me and I'm like, okay, I see them. Cool. <laughs> it's like the spy glasses you can see behind your head. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's Naomi walking around now everywhere she goes. <laughs> all right. Some traditions hold that a vampire cannot enter a home unless invited in by the owner. Yes. So that's another thing. Yes, I guess. that is true. Do not yeah. invite them in. <laughs> I don't know. Nobody invited Edward Cullen in to the house and he just fucking came. <laughs> well, didn't she be, she wasn't like come over at some point? No, like, he like went he just to her bedroom and while she was sleeping and they hadn't even had like a conversation yet. And That's just, just being a watching creeper. Her, yeah, that whole series is fucking creepy as shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> through folklore, vampires were believed to be more active at night. They were not generally considered vulnerable to sunlight, but I think that the myth came because mm-hmm. they're more active at night. Right. I feel like because prey is sleeping at that point, it's easier. That's a good point, they actually. Can conceal their, themselves in the shadows. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. How do how do you kill a vampire, Naomi? I've heard a wooden stake specifically through the heart. Yep. Or um a, a silver. Of some sort, but also like directly to the heart or, yeah. or sunlight. Yeah. So staking is the most commonly cited method to destroy a vampire, particularly in South Slavic cultures. Ash was the preferred wood in Russia and the Baltic states. Hawthorn was used in Serbia and oak was used in Silesia. Okay. <laughs> um, Aspen was also used for stakes. Potential vampires were most often staked in the heart. Mm -hmm. The mouth in Russia and northern Germany is where they would have been staked. And the stomach is where they would have been staked in northern or northeastern Serbia. Okay. Decapitation was the preferred method in Germany and western Slavic areas. Love a good decapitation. (laughs) The vampire's head, body, or clothes could also be spiked and pinned to the earth to prevent rising. Okay. Um, the Romani people drove steel or iron needles into a corpse's heart and placed bits of steel in the mouth over the eyes, ears, and between the fingers at the time of burial to prevent this body from turning mm-hmm. into a vampire. A vampire, yeah. Yeah. A vampy. A vampy. <laughs> <laughs> they also placed hawthorn in the corpse's sock and drove a hawthorn stake through the legs. In 2006, archaeologists actually discovered a brick forced into the mouth of a female corpse from a 16th century burial are you clapping because you know yeah this? I'm okay. like, yes, I was gonna talk about that too thank you I can okay I'll stop there no no talk about it. go 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 well I just have one more sentence the brick was part of a vampire slaying ritual yeah yeah okay yeah dude actually it's not the only one um where did it go on I here? also have in Bulgaria over 100 mm-hmm. skeletons with metal objects embedded in the torso have mm-hmm. also been discovered Yes. So yes. that's my bit. I stopped there because I knew you had some good goodies for me. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump on to the fact that you were talking about how they had bricks in their mouth. Yes. So was it inscribed it, with something or was it just a brick? It was just a brick. Okay. So it was in uh, Lugano, Italy. An archaeologist site. Uh, it's a fifth century cemetery, and it was actually a site that was sadly be- that it was a cemetery for children. Aww. So that's pretty freaking sad. But it was the fifth century. There was lots of mortalities at young ages, and um, there was the like sixteen year old female that they found. But they also found a ten year old boy who had a brick in his mouth as well. And what scientists have now figured out is a lot of these kids in this specific uh, cemetery in Italy, they most likely passed away from malaria or it was a plague victims. So, Uh, yeah. So that happened a lot though, where they thought that one person got sick. And then if people in their family continue to get sick, that that initial person must've been a vampire and made the whole family sick. So that's when they started putting like bricks and stuff into their mouths so that they couldn't actually bite you or get your blood. So that was the whole reason behind it. Mm -hmm. But that was mainly in Italy, I believe. Okay. So I kind of want to talk about Europe for a moment. Back in the 16 and 1700s, doctors were actually trying to find ways to prevent vampires from happening, actually. Like they straight up told the public, yeah, vampires are real. 
we're going to find a way to help you. <laughs> so Damn. they were, at least they, they were, were honest. They were actively trying to figure this out. So in Poland in 16, mainly in the 1690s or the late 1600s, a lot of people in Poland and Russia have reports of people physically seeing the vampires. It was in newspapers. It was in medical journals that the vampires would gorge themselves on human or animal blood. And this would just pour out apparently of their orifices. So their ears, their nose, their eyes were like just overflowing with blood. Okay. So the way that they would know if somebody was a vampire is by digging up their grave. Mm. So they would open up the coffin and if inside this coffin was a whole bunch of nasty, gross blood and guts, they were apparently vampires or they were becoming vampires. So what they did in Poland and Russia, when they, you know, would open up this coffin and find all this nasty entrails in there, they would take the blood and the nastiness from those graves and they would make bread. Yeah, bread. <laughs> um, so they would make bread out of all the nastiness that they would find in the graves, which I'm not quite sure why they decided to make bread, but that's what they decided to make. Let's see what else. Oh, so what they would do is after they would make the bread, they would then decapitate the dead body and put a stake through their heart and then have them cremated. So they made sure to check off all those boxes back in the late 1600s. Other ways of them finding out if somebody was either a vampire or becoming a vampire, they that person would be shivering a lot. They would be nauseous a lot. They would have odd spasms and they would have nightmares about death, which I'm like, that could be a number of reasons somebody is shivering or being nauseous. So But that was one of the ways where they would find out if somebody was a vampire. I also kind of want to touch on, you mentioned that when they would open up the the coffins and the graves, how there would be like blood around their mouth, you know? Yeah. And the reason for that. So for natural decomposition, the skin does shrink up. And the main places where it shrinks up is like your mouth and your nails, because that's what's exposed first is those like, you know, calcium deposits. So this would make the teeth and your nails just look longer than they were when you were alive because through decomposition, everything kind of shrinks up. Um, But what would also happen is all of the gases and stuff in your body from your organs has to come out somehow. So it would come Mm -hmm. out through your mouth. Gross. I did not like that sound. that's (laughs) why. So that's why they would be like, oh my gosh, there's blood around their mouth. It's like, actually, that's part of natural decomposition is there would be blood actually probably protruding from the mouth. Not always a whole lot. Like they're exaggerating when they're like, it was full of blood. It's like, okay, it wasn't full of blood, but there would definitely be blood around the mouth area and on their face. So was that Louie? Yeah. Did you hear him? (laughs) So In some cases, they would also just stab the deceased person with a wooden spike. And yes, there would be noises coming out when you stab a dead body because of the gases. So people were also thinking, see, they were definitely a vampire because we stabbed them and they made a noise and then they died. No, actually, you just stabbed a dead person and their, you know, gases came out. (laughs) But they didn't know that back in the 1600s. So it's okay. (laughs) Um, So thank you, scientists, for figuring that out. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on was a lot of the times, especially in the 1700s. So there was a lot of different, you know, vampire sightings back then. And a lot of it really had to go back to rabies and tuberculosis. So, I mean, that just makes you go crazy. If you happen to get rabies, you will go crazy. And tuberculosis made people extremely sick and they could never stop it. Didn't they cough up mm-hmm. blood too during yeah. tuberculosis? So Ex- yes, yes, they did. So people were thinking that they were drinking blood at night because they were coughing up blood. And it's like, no, that's them very, very ill. Um, another one. Oh, that's what I want to talk about. So there is a disease that people have contributed to being the vampire disease. And pretty much what this is is a very, very bad sensitivity to light. And it's really just a skin condition. So when, and I might mispronounce this, but it's called porphy, por, porphyra, catan, uh, it's lots of science words. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
in short, PCT. <laughs> so when those that have PCT go out into sunlight, they are they most likely get blisters immediately, like al- almost immediately. As soon as they step out of the house, they would get blisters from the sunlight. Their skin is, it was extremely thin, but their hair can grow a lot faster than just normal people without PCT. So they have a very thin skin, which probably means that they're also pale. Um, They can't step outside because they'll most likely die and their hair grows a lot faster. So that is always odd when you see that they always have some sort of sores or injury on the skin. And that's just because they had, you know, thick, thin little paper skin. Um, this, this disease also causes liver damage, which can make somebody pale or like a yellow color. And it's just something that, you know, happens to some people. Sadly, it's actually a genetic thing. So Mm that happened a lot, but yeah. So that was just a few things I definitely wanted to touch on about like scientific stuff about vampires. (laughs) Cool, cool, cool. All right. So I'm going to get into the stories. So have you heard of the blood countess, Serena? No, apart from what you told me the other day at work. <laughs> <laughs> so the blood countess, her name is actually Countess Elizabeth Bathelroy. I'm sure other people might have heard of her, but I just wanted to talk on the fact that I do not believe that she was a vampire. A lot of people call her that and say that she was definitely drinking blood and whatnot, but there's no real evidence saying that she physically drank blood. There's plenty of people saying that they definitely saw her bathing in it. Though. So Ooh, that's like American yeah. Horror Story. Yes. Heaven. Yes. I believe that's where they got the inspiration from yeah. was from this woman. So Louie, do not attack the string. All right. So <laughs> Elizabeth Bathelroy, she was born in 1560 and she was born to a very wealthy family. Um, they had a big like area in Hungary. And Slovakia and Romania. So her family had a whole bunch of property. She was a countess. So her dad owned a whole bunch of property. People were paying them to pretty much live there, like taxes and cities and shit. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she was also very educated because her family had that high standards um, or had that high whatever in society. So she was very much educated and apparently she was very attractive. She was promised to a prominent Hungarian when she was 11 years old. She then ended up having a child with somebody who was not her her to be husband when she was 14. (laughs) Yeah. So scandalous. Um, So (laughs) she, she had the child when she was 14 to this lover. And then she ended up marrying that prominent Hungarian guy when she was like 14, like so soon after that. So she had the kid and then they got married. Her husband, um, I don't have his name, but this prominent Hungarian man was always off fighting battles. And back in the 15, 1600s, that's mainly what was going on in that area of the world because the Catholic people wanted to take control over everything. And then there was Islam that was trying to also like come up and take over. So there was lots of religious conflict going on. So he was always gone fighting battles. So Elizabeth Bathelroy had many lovers. <laughs> she had a daughter from one of her other lovers. So this is child number two without the husband. And not a whole lot is known about them, honestly. They do know that she had at least five children and about three of them were from her husband. Also, what's what was really sad is a few of the babies ended up dying through infancy. So mm. I'm sure that's very traumatic for any mom. Keep in mind, her husband was always off fighting and Elizabeth was left to deal with everything that a countess or count had to deal with. So she had to deal with all the money from the estates and she had to keep it all together and on the books. Elizabeth was very prominent, like, as I said, but she was actually had a higher societal standing than her husband. So he actually kept her name. She didn't change hers. I love that. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I was like, I thought that was pretty cool. He straight up hyphenated his name back in the 1600s. So we're going to fast forward and we are now in 1610. All right. And Elizabeth was accused of murdering a whole bunch of women who was coming to her home. It was said that she killed at least 600 women. 
600 mm-hmm. women and girls. These were all girls like under the age of 18. And that's like putting it nicely. It could be even younger than 18. So 600 girls, women that she murdered in her home. She's actually on the Guinness book of world records for her, <laughs> for the most prolific female murderer. So why, why? did they make that a thing that somebody should now like want to compete with? <laughs> Yo, I hope nobody's ready to compete with this woman. So why, why, why do you think all of this happened? Why do you think she murdered these women? Got any ideas? Steal their youth. I don't know. Pretty much. Actually, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So why did she murder all these women? To stay young and beautiful, of course. She would have all these young women come to her home to, to work and be servants. Or she would actually be taking in other prominent Hungarian women And they were supposed to come to her for educational purposes. So Mm -hmm. other prominent people were sending their daughters to this woman saying, yeah, she's really good. She's this high, you know, countess thing, has all kinds of money, runs everything. And then they just wouldn't come back and they wouldn't hear from their daughters ever again. That's so sad. So there were so many victims and I don't want to get into like all the detail of exactly what she did but she would torture these women by the end of it. She really just wanted to drain them of their blood. She would sometimes bite her victims, but she would also whip them. She would cut their noses. She would cut their lips and she would stick needles in their nails. Any type of mutilation she probably did to these women. And the whole point for her was to bathe in their blood, use their blood dry it on her face. And apparently it kept her young and youthful. I do have a note in here that she believed that also consuming the blood would also keep her young. But as I said, there's the real only evidence that we see is that she bathed in it. But who the fuck knows? It was back in the 1600s. (laughs) Even if she didn't drink the blood or bathe in it, these women were still murdered because of Elizabeth. She murdered these women, regardless if she was a vampire or not. There are some that believe that she was wrongly accused. Um, Why? (laughs) Why? (laughs) Because she was a countess and people owed her money. So people think that they started accusing her of this craziness so that they didn't have to pay their debts. Yeah, that yeah, there were some people who really I mean, thought that she was set up. No, people re- legit sense, thought that they set her up. But I, but all I, these women were missing. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I think that's the elites trying to cover it up again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even back in the 60s. Dude, for real. They're like, oh, no, don't worry about her. You know, people owe her a lot of money. She couldn't have killed all these women. Then where did these women go? Yeah. Like, and there's all legit service. There's legit service also servants who also worked there that didn't die that would see these women always come in and then never leave. So it's like, what the hell were you doing? So she in 1610 is when she was accused of this. And then she was brought to justice. And she instead of going to prison, she was kept in her castle on pretty much house arrest. So So they didn't torture her and do all the bad things. Nope. But you know what happened to her two quote unquote accomplices that would bring the women to her? One was beheaded (laughs) and one was kept in a dungeon until they died. (laughs) Yeah, but not the countess. Not the countess. Not Elizabeth Bathelroy. She was able... She was able to live in that castle for another four years in isolation. I'll put that in quotes. Who knows exactly how isolated the woman was. She was comfortable. Yeah. So and then she died in 1614. And that's the story of Countess Elizabeth Baffleroy. What a bitch. <laughs> right? But everybody calls her the blood countess, the vampire countess. And I'm like, no, she was just an evil, torturing she was just woman. A like, cunt. What do you mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> so that's Elizabeth so Baffleroy. Even now, even now, they don't uh-huh. they don't drop the title. Nope. She's like, still countess. And you can look up Elizabeth Baffleroy. The first thing you're gonna see is vampire. That's the first thing that's gonna come up with her. And I'm like, no, she was a murderer. I think <laughs> so. that was just because of the association with the blood. But I mm-hmm. don't, I don't think that she was a vampire. I think she was just a bitch. Same here. Same here. So I want to talk about another, what would this be? Prolific or, you know, famous vampire. Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> Yay, this shout out is, to Jim. <laughs> thank you. I was going to say shout out to Jim. <laughs> He's the one who does our amazing intro music, guys. 
though, I'm going to be talking about Vlad the Impaler, the Prince of Wallachia. Well, that Vlad sounds the third. weird because then it sounds like we're calling him Vlad the Impaler, but he just really wanted us to talk about him. So that's why we're giving him a shout out. He is not evil. No, Jim is not evil. That's not what we're saying. But he Jim's did want cool us to fuck. cover this. Yes. <laughs> All right. Continue. All right. So Vlad, he was born before Elizabeth Balthoroy. He was born in 1431. Um, in the country what is now known as Transylvania, but it was originally called Wallachia. The famous Dracula's castle that is in Transylvania, Vlad never stepped foot in that castle. So there's that. It it was his family's castle, but he never lived there. He never stepped foot in there even as an adult. So yeah, he was mainly in um, like Romania and he grew up in this castle called Ponari Castle in Romania. Um, There is an episode of Ghost Hunters International, season one, episode 14, where they go to the um, Transylvania Dracula castle. So, but the lad was never there. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. In 1431, Vlad's dad, Vlad II, he was knighted king of Hungary. um, And he was made the Order of the Dragon, which was given to him as like, you are the order of the dragon now. And he was then given a last name of Dracul, which just means dragon. The order of the dragon, um, it was meant to defeat the Turkish and Ottoman empire, which was the Islam empire. So they were trying to, you know, that he was more on the Catholic side. So he was given this order of the dragon, Vlad Dracul in 1431. Uh, and around the castle, in Romania, not the one in Transylvania. It was right in the middle of where the Catholic and Christian Europe were fighting the Islam Ottoman Empire. So there was hella battles around this castle all the time. Just hella battles. Just hella battles, man. Like just carnage all the time. (laughs) So Vlad III, so our Vlad the Impaler, and his brother were imprisoned in Turkey at about the age of 12 in northern Turkey at the Toket Castle. The reason why they were imprisoned there was because their dad had brought them there. <laughs> and he was supposed, the dad was supposed to be talking with the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire in 1442. And everything kind of went sideways. I think he was trying to be like, like a double agent almost. And he was kind of caught. So the Ottoman Empire was like, "Uh uh-uh, your dad can leave, but we're keeping both of your sons. So they imprisoned the kids and they let the dad leave. So Hmm. Vlad and his brother Radu were in prison there for fucking years. So they were there for so long that the boys were actually given an education there. They were schooled in science, philosophy, and art. And they also became very good horsemen and warriors. So keep that in mind. His dad went there because he's on the Catholic side and his sons are now imprisoned on the Ottoman Empire side. And they're pretty much training them to fight for the Ottoman Empire, not what their dad was originally taking them there for. So their dad continued to battle throughout this whole time. And then he passed away in 1447. Vlad now wanted to become the royal, the ruler of like his dad's land. He was the next in line. He's like, I'm the next one. I should get the land. But they relied on the Ottoman Empire for military support since that's where he pretty much grew up was in that. And he actually had the land for about two months before another Ottoman ruler just decided to take over because they could do that. So when that happened, and that was in 1447. We don't have a whole lot of information on exactly what Vlad did up until 1456. So there's a good 10 years, nine to 10 years that he's kind of like just somewhere. (laughs) But what he did in 1456 is he decided to go and be with the Catholic European fighters. So now Mm -hmm. he is back on the side that his dad was originally on. And he then started battling the Ottoman Empire. And after the fall of, you know, Constantinople, which of course we all know about that battle, don't we? Europe was now able to go ahead and go further into Eastern Europe and take control of the land there. That is where Vlad's family is mainly from. So he went with them. And in the fort in 1460, he was able to get a hold of his dad's land finally. And he was very happy. However, 
in the 1460s. This is also when he started to impale people. So anybody who went against Vlad or was for the Ottoman Empire were e- immediately impaled. And this isn't just like throwing somebody onto a stake. He legit would, g- okay, this is gross. They would take this human and put them through a spike, through their under area, till it went through their entire body and out through their mouth or their head. Oh, so that was no. pretty freaking nasty. So at one point, a group of Ottoman men came to see Vlad. Something they were trying to discuss something with war and battles and land and shit. And Vlad asked them to take their turbans off. And they're like, well, actually, we, we don't take our turbans off. Like, dude, it's part of their religion. Let them keep the fucking turbans on, right? No. Vlad was like, oh, you don't want to take your turbans off? Well, guess what? You won't ever have to worry about that again. And nailed their turbans to their heads and then impaled them and put all of them around his castle. I was in 1462. This is only two years into him having his land back. So, okay, we backtrack because Mm -hmm. I'm still in pain from that last (laughs) thing that you just told me. Uh Uh-huh. Did, so people helped him then yeah do this Mm -hmm. like did they like each grab the side of the body i'm like trying to visualize pretty much but it was all okay because they were doing it for the the, pretty much the catholic church they were doing it for the church and so it was justified since the islams didn't want to you know convert to christianity pretty much or whatever it was but what losers yeah so yeah but no that that's exactly what happened it was all justified there was even at one point where the Pope at the time said that Vlad is totally okay with impaling people because it's he for- was a good yes. job, man. Yes, it going. Yes, no, it is documented that that was totally cool. Score. You want to know what that score was, by the way? Oh my God, what was it? Twenty three thousand men. Oh, <gasps> shut the fuck up. Twenty three thousand. Yep. Yep. Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, and it wasn't just men. He would also impel women and children. Oh my oh, God. Yeah. And Ugh. that I. I I'll gross you out when I get to that part too. <laughs> so I'm already why, grossed out. why would they say that Vlad the Impaler is a vampire? That a lot of people are saying was that it Bram the Stoker thing or like so a lot of people thought that Vlad was inspiration from Bram Stoker's Dracula, also. I thought re- that was a Irish yeah. vampire. Or or it could have been from the one in Rhode Island, which I'll get to later. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So what am I on? 1462, Sorry. I believe. Oh, no, you're good. So 1462, he impelled 23,000 men. And that's just because they didn't take their turbans off and he killed everybody who was in attendance with him. So Perfect. why did they consider him a vampire? Apparently, not only did he impale people, but then he would also eat around these people legit so you don't immediately die if you're impaled if it cannot (gasps) hit all of your organs okay so these people were suffering while vlad was just sitting at his table out in the open eating his food and he would dip his blood into their food and uh, dip his bread into their blood and then eat the bread so that is probably where the main rumor came from yes so yeah he would just dip his and bread into those that he, the, and they're watching. Yep. Exactly. I thought you were gonna say he like was carving off like pieces of them. They're sayings that he would have severed heads at his table while he was eating. So who knows? Oh. Yep. Yep. So after a few years, people didn't really like what he was doing to other people. And he was somehow exiled at some point. And during that exile, um, his brother took over and then that happened. And there's not a whole lot of information on exactly where Vlad was. But in 1476, Vlad was able to get his power back from his brother. And then within a year, the Ottomans ambushed him and killed him. Jesus. That was the end <laughs> of Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I said, there was plenty of stories in Germany and Russia that used to celebrate what he did. Ugh. And yeah, no, it was they it was all fine to them at that at that point in time. Now I'm sure nobody's like happy that he did this. I'm sure nobody's you know praising him for these yeah, horrible, horrible things. Fucking hope so. You would hope so. 
So yeah, um, that's Vlad the Impaler. And apparently he was a vampire, which I mean, if he was drinking blood and dipping his bread into it, maybe he was, but he was able to be ambushed and then murdered by the Ottomans. So they got their revenge. There's that story. <laughs> That's nuts. Thank you. Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Jim, for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, something I wanted to bring up was vampire bats and mm, how yeah. they're contributed to vampires. Don't know how they are, but Nobody knew about vampire bats until 1832 when Darwin, thank you, Darwin, saw that they were feeding on horses. So, yeah, that that was exactly so just keep that in mind, because the whole thing about, you know, vampires has been coming around since the fifth century and nothing was ever heard about bats and vampires until after 1832, which makes sense. Sorry, Mm -hmm. go ahead. No, well, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, he talks about him turning into bats and flying away. That wasn't published until 1897, so. Yeah, I was going to say, I do like that part of it, like thinking, Mm -hmm. oh, that, and then you turn into a vampire. Like, I do like that for some reason. It's just so interesting to me. (laughs) It is, yeah. Not real, but yeah. Shape-shifting. It's it's interesting. Come on. I do have other stories of vampires. Can we save it for <laughs> another episode? We could. We could do a part two if you wanted. Yeah, I think we're getting a little long here, but yeah. um, what if, what's some pop culture you have? Some All right. Pop culture vampires. Cool. <laughs> okay, so I am a so huge, huge fan of Anne Rice's vampires. If nobody knows that, I love them all. And... I just think that her vampires are probably more closely related to quote unquote, an authentic vampire. Like she doesn't have sparkle. They don't sparkle. Damn it. (laughs) (laughs) But like they don't die by stakes through the heart or by silver or by garlic. The main way to kill those vampires is strictly through sunlight, fire or decapitation. (laughs) Okay. So what we what we named earlier on, we were talking about like the cultural <laughs> mm-hmm. references as opposed to just recent, more recent. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. cool, yeah. cool. Um, another uh, vampire books that I read a lot as a kid was um, his name. the The author, his name is Christopher Pike, and he has these. Uh, they're like um, what what is it like preteen or young adult? He's a young adult. Uh, author and he talks about this vampire they're called the last vampires or the last vampire and what I liked about his vampire was she didn't have to kill anybody to get her sustenance of their blood okay so what she would do is she would bite the person's neck and then she would bite herself and get some of her blood into the person and this wouldn't turn them into a vampire but it would make them kind of numb so that they were more willing to let her bite him, bite them and then later on her blood would also help heal them so there wouldn't be any mark okay i've heard so. about the vampire blood healing mm-hmm. like i think vampire diaries is yeah that. Probably. i haven't i just actually recently started reading it Mm-hmm. I've watched a couple of seasons, but I'm trying to read the books now. They just bother me. They're so <laughs> different from the show. I've never seen the show. Yeah, they're different, but yeah. it's okay. <laughs> I'll get through it. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, I talked about Anne Rice, the Vampire Chronicles. There's so many, and they're coming out with a TV show, and I've been fangirling for like three months about it. Um, if you guys are interested in that, it's going to be Interview with a Vampire. It's on AMC coming up next year. And mm-hmm. we have our very own Grey Worm is going to be in it. And he's playing one of my favorite characters, Louis. So if you don't know who Grey Worm is, damn it, watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> oh, yes. He's amazing. <laughs> yes. And he's, oh, and he's playing your favorite character. He's you love him so much character. in Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm so excited. You have a type, Naomi. I'm going to tell you about your type. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and then um, they did just, um, if you've ever seen the movie, um, Interview with a Vampire, Kirsten Dunst plays the character Claudia and they just announced the woman who's going to be playing her. Her name is Bailey Bass. She was in Avatar, but I'm not sure exactly which character she was. So there's that. Of course, there's also Bram Stoker's Dracula. 
which we were talking with a coworker at work about how boring that book is. So. Shout out Austin. We know you listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, I agree, man. It's pretty freaking boring. Yeah. One of the first written like books or novels about vampires actually came out in 1819. And this was written by a man who I I don't think I continued to spell his name because I can't you read my handwriting. I'm like, I don't know. John Pol- Polydeon, I think, or Polidori. And see why I'm like, I don't know what I wrote. She just gave up. <laughs> it's called The Vampire, but vampire spelled V-A-M-P-Y-R-E. Okay. I've seen it spelled that way too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was back in 1819. And there was also um, a novella a book that came out in 1871 called Carmilla. And it was about a woman who was obsessed with another woman who happened to be a vampire. So, and that was back in 1871. <laughs> So I thought that was cool. I'm going to have to look into it. Yeah. And there's so many movies out there, guys. Oh, yeah. yeah. You just Google it and they all come up. Dude, like I've actually, I've watched Nosferatu. I own it on DVD. That is probably the very first vampire movie. And it's that one, like I'm doing the thing. Like, uh, he like looks like that and his bangs are all out and he has these hella long nails. <laughs> Have you seen that picture? I'm doing no, it. No, but we're going to post her, a picture on Twitter, I think. <laughs> like, uh. be doing that. <laughs> Specifically That's like, you <laughs> doing that. So okay. I'll Photoshop but... some bangs on you. <laughs> and very long nails. We'll see. And then uh, some of them don't even have fangs. So it's like, that's where true, do you, yeah. or the things look so different, like in Supernatural, those things uh-huh. are fucking scary. Yeah. Yeah. They're or it's so like terrifying. all of their teeth are fangs. Yeah. And then in some, it's just like one on each side. You have little, two little fangs or yeah. Mm-hmm. Twilight, yeah. they don't even, they just are normal teeth. Like <laughs> They're just, I just bite you. It yeah. hurts a lot because I'm gnawing on you. Yeah. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, one of my favorite vampire movies is abraham lincoln vampire hunter i couldn't have... get it no no i, I fell asleep great. like four different times trying to watch that movie girl oh, <laughs> i man. know well and there's also dark shadows have you seen dark shadows have i seen dark shadows naomi yeah come on no. you've seen dark shadows no, no. i haven't seen any movie it has johnny depp me. in it johnny oh, depp well. is in it i might have I mean, to watch it but ava green is in it oh my gosh <laughs> Okay, now I want to say, like, go watch Penny Dreadful now. So that you can, it's a TV show. (laughs) See, okay, we're going to just get into the long list of things that Serena has. So we're going to go ahead and end it here, you guys. And yeah, hope you so, enjoyed that episode. We do have social media where yes, can you find we do. us. <laughs> you can find us on any social media platform. And if you Please. Google us, we come up. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> yeah, we did that today. Our Twitter came up. So if you could go to Weird Mythic Podcast on Instagram, we're also on Facebook.com slash Weird Mythic. We also have a email address if you guys could send us any suggestions about shows or any personal experiences that you have that are pretty creepy. Go ahead and send us an email at weirdmythicpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, come hang out with us on Twitter. It's just at Weird Mythic. We have a giveaway going on right now until mm-hmm. October 31st where you guys can win some cool merch. You can be in an episode and just hang out with us for a little bit maybe be a yeah. super or something you guys and then um yeah we have the merch like we said we have a code for you guys that's code mm-hmm. mythic m-y-t-h-i-c i'm not gonna ask naomi to spell it this time <laughs> it's not spelled with an i guys if you were wondering <laughs> i mean there is an i in it but not but in not that part two eyes <laughs> so yep <laughs> You can visit our merch site. I'll have that link down below. You get 10% off at checkout. I love mm-hmm. it. Seeing your guys' faces wear yes. our merch. Yes. Our <laughs> I do love all the pictures you've been getting of people wearing our I know, faces. I love it's freaking it. great. You. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. All yes. proceeds are going directly back into the podcast. Mm-hmm. This is yes, Naomi, are. Serena, Poopy Paws, and Louie. And we Louis. are outie.